Hey there, welcome to the Victory Lifestyle channel. I'm Grayson Wilson, and today we're going to be talking about the Word of God and the, the importance and the power of the Word of God in the life of the Christian. So this is something that, although we've talked about all the supernatural signs and wonders and all the type of stuff that the power of God that should be on display in the life of the Christian, this topic right here is the foundation that produces all the things that we've been talking about. If you don't talk about this topic, then you have not touched on the essential thing that the entire Christian life is based on. You see, the Bible talks about the Word of God, about how the Word of God is the foundation for the life of the believer, that, about how the Spirit inspired the Word of God through the prophets and through the, the people of God, that he would elect people that he put in charge, that he would give to him his Word, and then they would send that message out to the people. To, to let the people know, hey, this is what God says. This is what goes. It was the thing, literally the bedrock of, of their entire lives was the word of God. And God talks about in Deuteronomy, he says, the revealed things that, or the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to you so that you may do all the things of this covenant. And he says, if you hearken diligently unto my voice, then, and you to, to hear and to do all that I command you, then I will set you high above all the nations of the earth. So according to God, his word, if you hearken unto it and hear it, right? Hearken means hear. Like I heard somebody talk about recently, like uh, the difference in hear and like hear, like hearken. He was talking about like going uh, skydiving. And he and he chose to skydive, but without an instructor on him because he didn't want to be like, like behind this guy, like you know, jumping out of the plane. He wanted to do it by himself if he was going to do it right. And so he's sitting in this class, and they're telling him, you know, like okay, so whenever you pull this, make sure you pull it like this, and if this, you know, and get this result. And he he didn't really like totally hear what the guy said. So he so what does he do? Right? He's like, can you can you say that again? He's like, repeat that again for me, please. Like. I got to make sure, like, it's like a, the, the urgency, right? Because if you don't hear what that guy says, then you you could die. There's a good chance you could die, right? Yet the Bible is the exact same way, but with your spiritual life. And your spiritual life isn't like your body. Your body's going to die, you know? You got 100 years on this earth, and then your body's going to die. So, so, yeah, don't jump in front of a car. But if you do, I mean, you only sacrifice 80 years. If you If you sacrifice your spirit, right? or your soul, then you sacrifice eternity, you know? There's way more at stake when it comes to the Word of God and understanding the words of God and His instruction. And I think a lot of times you kind of hear, like, people, they're like, oh, you know, like, like they just, like, they, like, put this passivity and, like, this, like, l this, like, light regard for the Word of God. And that's, you, that what the Word of God calls that is it calls that a lack of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord produces in you a, a reverence for God and a, and a reverence for what he said is so. Like to, to live your life based on that and, and to be certain that you understand what his word says and that you're clear with God and that you're operating the way that God told you to operate because God is the one who determines your life. He determines what what's a life well lived. He determines all that type of stuff. God's the ultimate judge. And people don't like to, to talk about the justice of God, but the justice of God, you can't even have mercy if you don't have justice. You know, people want to talk about, oh, the grace of God, the mercy of God. If if God wasn't just, there's nothing for him to be merciful about. And and then he, if God isn't just, then, then he didn't have to send Jesus. So God is just, and that's a good thing. We don't, we don't want a God who just permits evil, you know, what if we finally go to heaven and he just is like, it's totally fine. You know, if, if this person's killing people or this person's like abusing people, that's like people, you, the justice of God is, is important. You know, it's part of who he is. And if you love God, then you're going to love all of who God is. You're going to love his justice. You're going to, you're going to even love his wrath. You know, God's wrath is not something to be despised or something to like, Put under the rug and like let's not talk about that you know we can't talk about hell we can't talk about god's wrath no like it's it's part of who he is you know they're they're important i already sidetracked a little bit as i always do but i'm gonna i'm gonna 
I'm going to lay out for you the importance of the Word of God in this one statement, all right? And then we're going to get into some things that the Word of God does for you. But this is what you have to understand about the, the Word of God, is this, is that the Word of God, your revelation, okay, your revelation and understanding of the Word of God will directly determine the outcome of your life. Your life will be limited in the altitude and the success that you have and the final, like, you know, I guess report in heaven whenever God evaluates your life, right? And you stand before Christ and you, and you give an account for what you did for him, right? And just like the, the overall determination of your life will be limited and determined by your revelation of the word of God. So this isn't something that's like, I, I feel like it's not understood. I don't know. I mean, maybe I just, maybe I've always been like intellectual. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I've been somebody that like, sees this because this was my thing you know i got saved when i was in the baptist church and so for me it was like when i got saved i i wanted it to be genuine i wanted it to be real you know i didn't want to live a fake christian life and so i would put myself under like under the the hammer under the microscope and i would like look at myself and i would be like am i actually saved like i i I was pretty sure i was saved but like has a real change happened inside of me am i right with god does my life biblically look like a salvation like somebody who's a christian like is that me you know because i didn't want to like i didn't want any surprises i wanted to to be certain that my life looked like this book and that my that that i'm right with god and i'm going the right direction and so that that was what started off my my search in the word of god where i wasn't willing to just say oh okay yeah this scripture says that so therefore that you know check like I wasn't willing to just like willy nilly like say this interprets this or this says this. Like I wanted to be certain and the, with the Holy Spirit confirming inside of me that what I'm believing is correct and I'm going the right route. Because what many people don't understand is that you have a responsibility. You're responsible for getting revelation on the Bible. The Bible is not something that where God gave it to you and He's like, okay, well, there's a lot of gray areas in it, you know, and so. You're not going to understand everything, and there's some things you'll never be able to understand in here, uh, in my word to you. But uh, you know, do your do your best, and that's okay. And you know, as long as you get up here, then you're good. And uh, like that's all. Like no, it says God is not God is no respecter of persons. Like God doesn't just like it's not just like a pass fail. Everybody like like the people like Reinhard Bonnke and Billy Graham and those people that did great things for God are just like have the same outcome in in heaven as like somebody who just like didn't didn't give a crap about any of the opportunities God gave them and like didn't care about God and like just slipped on into heaven. It's not the same. Like it it's it's you we live in a cause and effect world. We live in a world where like you you reap what you sow. That's a Bible principle. And so God isn't just this word isn't just like oh, you know, like oh, it's my interpretation and that's your interpretation and oh well, you know. It's like no, 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 no. There's a truth. This this Bible says what it says, and it's your responsibility to spend time with God and to figure out what He's saying. And He gave it to you for your benefit, so that you can know what He's saying, and so that you can live above the challenges of your life because of your revelation of the Word of God. You see, the revelation of the Word of God is is the thing that brings you over the trials. You know. It's the thing that actually gives you the answer. So let's get into these three points. But but I want to I want to state that one more time. Your life is limited by your revelation of the Word of God. Whatever you don't get a revelation on is something that you are now limited in being able to accomplish. Like if you don't know that Christ is the healer, right? That He heals all Christians, then you're not you're definitely not going to have a healing ministry. You're definitely not going to be able to do that. If you don't know how to preach the gospel, like what the Bible says about preaching of the gospel, then your preaching is, you're not going to be able to preach with power. You might be able to get up there and and give a good speech and like be a good orator, you know? And like people will be like, oh yeah, like, you know, that guy's just like such a good communicator, you know? Like, no, you you might be able to do that, but are you going to be able to do anything that has any power? Not according to the word of God, you know? You're not going to be able to preach with power. You've got to, whatever you have revelation on 
Like this is the thing that limits the ability of you to operate. You can only do so much for God as you have revelation of his kingdom and his and his rules and, and the way that he operates. Because he operates in a certain way. You know, not every key opens every door. Like there's a there's a key that opens some doors. There's some there's some keys that only open one door. Like for example, there's only one key that opens the door to financial prosperity, and that's sowing giving. That's giving. Faith filled giving and generosity. That's the only key that opens financial prosperity. There's no other key that that opens that. There are some other like physical keys, but they just they they don't open the door of supernatural financial increase. Like it's the giving into the things of God that produces that because the Bible says it. So you getting saved doesn't open the door to financial prosperity. Or for example, you getting saved doesn't open the door to like you understanding Christ's healing. There's plenty of people that that knew they were going to heaven, but they had no faith for their healing and they died. Like that happens all the time. There are people that have never heard that Christ paid for their healing on the cross, and so they died. I mean, they got sick and they died. And they didn't they didn't ever believe that God would heal them, and so they made no effort down that route because nobody told them. So let's get into this. Here are some points here. Point number one is this. If you're going to understand the value of the Word of God, you have to get this. Number one, you have to understand and believe that the Word of God is light that reveals every answer to every problem that you will ever face. You must understand and believe that the Word of God has the solution to every single problem that exists in your life. Every single problem. There's not a solution or there's not an issue that you will ever face that the Word of God won't shed light on. I mean, the Word of God... It talks about how you have the mind of Christ, but the word of God is like, it, it like basically makes you, it, it elevates your ability to like, to like see life. Honestly, I mean, it, it, it will elevate you in every single way the Bible will. But one of those is your ability to problem solve life. Like you can, it just naturally builds like leadership It naturally builds like problem solving and like people skills and all that type of stuff. Like my ability to understand people over the last seven years of like seeking the Lord and like his word and like understanding and like growing in God has drastically, drastically increased because of reading the word of God. Like I can see like when you under, cause the Bible illuminates the things of the heart. So before we go into that, Psalm 119 verse 130 says this, it says the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So it connects right here. It connects how the word brings light to bringing understanding to the symbol. So Jesus talks about, do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Does your heart understand like, like the things of God, right? So I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this. Like, So whenever you get, whenever the word of God enters into your heart, like whenever you soften your heart to receive the word of God, then according to this scripture, the word of God is light that lightens like inside where with your spiritual eyes, you can now see what's really going on so that you now have the understanding necessary to take, to solve the problem at hand. You see, this is why revelation is so important because you can, you can read this a hundred times, right? And not, see something but then the moment that you see it you now have an inner like you could see it in here like inside you can see that's what that is that's how that works that's the way in which that operates and now i know what to do now i have the answer right and once you see it you can never unsee it ever again like like whenever i've realized how deliverance worked then i'm never going to unsee that again like once you've cast out a demon out of somebody and you now understand what, what it takes to cast out a demon and how it works, right? And why the person could have a demon and like all that type of stuff. Number one, you don't unsee that. You ha- you now have light on it and you could see it forever. Like you get it. But then number two is unless I got revelation on that, I would have never seen that. Ever. It like 
you, I never would have known how to cast out a demon. I would have thought many times you think, you know, but until the, the word of God enters into your heart, you don't have sufficient light to solve the problems at hand. And so what that means is, is that you're limited, right? You're now limited in what you could do for God. You're limited in what you can overcome, honestly. I mean, you, there's, there's certain things you won't be able to overcome. You can't overcome sickness. I'm talking like big, like, like life-threatening sickness, unless you have the revelation of the Word of God on your healing, on your protection. And, and therefore, you can't also, you're going to be limited in what you can go and, and be used for to heal. Like, look at, look at the disciples. Think about this for a second. Jesus sent the disciples out. He said, go out and preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. And then he said this, and cleanse the lepers. Cleanse the lepers. How did Jesus cleanse the lepers? He laid his hand on him and he was made whole, right? So if you're called to go out and cleanse the lepers, then you won't be able to cleanse the leper with confidence unless you believe that the power of God in you is greater than the power of sickness that's coming at you uh, to destroy you. Because that's a contagious disease, right? This is why, I mean, this is why you, you have like every church in America shutting down for the coronavirus, but then you have like the, the healing movements in like the 50s and the 60s, right? With like Oral Roberts and all those people. Never once shut down a meeting for tuberculosis. Never once shut down a meeting for, for the flu or for any of the, the diseases that were actually like significant diseases knocking people out in their, in their generation. So why was that the case? Because they had a revelation on the fact that, that they saw inside that they have power over sickness and disease by the blood of Jesus and by the authority of being a Christian. They saw that, it, that God told them to do it, therefore he will protect them to do what he told them to do. Because they saw in the word that God never calls somebody to do something that he hasn't already given them the power and the favor to be able to accomplish, Right? But if you don't see that in the word, you can't do that, right? Your life will be limited by the, by the amount of word that you have. Hebrews 4, verse 2 through 13. I always like, I always have plans for like where I'm going to go and I always go a completely different direction or like I always like end up getting more intense or serious than I ever intended, <laughs> ever thought I would be. It's kind of funny. So... So Hebrews 4, verse 12 through 13 says this. It says, The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So what do you see here? Up from the scripture. Number one, it says that the word of God has is living and powerful. So it's a living word. It's alive. Jesus is alive today, right? Jesus is the word of God. The word of God is eternal. It's alive forever. Like it stands firm in the heavens, which is also why God's promises in the Old Testament still apply today. Because God doesn't promise you something in the Old Testament that he does away with. No promise or word of God ever disappears. Which is why you have people like David Oyedepo overseas who his wife is, is pregnant with her child and then she comes home one night and she says, Honey, I started having bleeding and I went to the doctor and the doctor said that we had a miscarriage. And he just he responds without even thinking about it. Just straight from straight from the word of God and his spirit. He said, It cannot be so. Now can we eat our food? Like that that's it. Like he he was beyond, it was beyond here. Like he had just put it in his, in his heart, like sowed that into his heart, the promises of God that, that you shall, shall no longer be barren or have miscarriage, which is what is, is stated in Exodus. I don't know what verse, but it's in Exodus. So he has this promise of Exodus so built in his spirit that the challenge comes, the threat comes and without even thinking, just boom, like out of his mouth, like it can't be so like that was his declaration of faith. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You speak what's in the heart. It's a principle of the word of God. 
And that, that's just what comes out of his mouth because that was so built into his heart because he's so hidden his, God's word in his heart that he, it says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Right? He'd so planted that in his heart that like that was what came out. The Bible, it, it discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. It reveals like what's in here, right? It, literally, it, it, like it slices in to show you and to divide between soul and spirit, right? What is well, what? So when you read this, it's like a mirror. And then when you look at verse 13, it says, There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So God, his judgment is perfect, right? He knows exactly what is what. Things, it's, there's not gray to him. He sees exactly what is what. And this is his word, right, to us to, to like prepare us for this, for this account that we have to give him, right? But, but to give us revelation. That's the point of the word. He gave us the word to give us revelation so that we can know whatever we need to know, right? And he says that all things are, are laid open to him to whom we must give account, right? So it talks about the word, and then it talks about this judgment. It talks about we have to stand before God and give account to our life and about how this word reveals to us the thoughts and intents of our heart. So what it is is the Bible shows you, it's like it's, it's like the judgment of God ahead of time. Like before you have to stand before God, you can go and read the word and figure out what God's judgments are. You can figure out where you are, what you're doing, and where you stand so that you can figure out what you need to do to be right with God and to be walking on the right path. It says that that the word of God is a lamp under your feet and a light under your path. Like it shows you where you're going. It shows you the path and where that's going to, the destination that that's going to arrive to. And notice how it says, it divides between soul and spirit. So it literally talks about how there's a difference in your soul and your spirit. Like what is from you and what is from the spirit of God in your spirit, right? Like what's just coming from me and my thinking or my feelings or what is coming from the Holy Spirit speaking to my spirit or from the my conscience that God's put in my spirit to like be able to like understand what's right and wrong. Like wh- what's coming from what? Because if you don't know the difference, then you could be just operating by your own desires, your own like feelings, and not be operating by where God's li- guiding you, and you could be going off the path. God's given you the ability to live life on the path, and you don't have to go through trials or whatever to figure it out. People say s- stuff like, oh, you know, there's some things you can never learn unless you, unless you first fail, or unless you first, like, you know, like suffer pain or loss beforehand to, to learn. Like you can only learn some things by experience. That that's it's kind of bullcrap, honestly. Honestly, because it says that the word of God brings success. It trains you up so that you can be thoroughly equipped for every single good work. The Second Timothy three verse sixteen says, "All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work." So. You don't, did, did Jesus have to go and like learn by experience, like what was right and wrong? Like he had to like, you know, he had to screw up a couple of times before he got it right. No, no, it's bull crap. He, he learned from the word of God. He spent time with God in prayer, got revelation on the word of God on what it says. And then he went out there and he hit the target. That's what God gives us the ability to do. You don't have to learn by, by failure. You can, you can stay on the path of God's perfect will for the rest of your life and never stray from it. You can, because the Holy Spirit guides you, and he will guide you in the way that you, that you should go. He'll even guide you in the words of the right place you need to see to get the revelation you need to get the victory in that present time. So, but if you don't get light on it, then you, you're walking in darkness, right? It talks about if you walk in darkness, then like you don't know where you're going. You're going to stumble. But God doesn't want you to do that. So, so he's given you his word to illuminate in your heart what is true, what is the path, what, is, what produces what, like, and how the kingdom of God operates and how you can get from point A to point B so that you accomplish all the will of God for your life. Okay, point number two. You know, I'm going to throw out one point, one more idea on that last one. And this is a good, a good thing to address. So... 
What about experiences, right? What about experiences? If you go and you look at Acts, I want to say it's Acts 11, but don't don't hold me to that. But there's a story in Acts 11 where Peter goes and preaches to the this, uh, I think it's like the centurion's house. I could be wrong again. But uh, he preaches to the, these Gentiles, and then the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles as he's preaching, and he's like stunned. Because he thought it wasn't God's will for the Gentiles to have the gospel. But then God confirmed via the Holy Spirit, right? So the Spirit, they got baptized in the Spirit as he's preaching, which is a work of God, right? And he saw the signs. He saw like, okay, the same way we got the Spirit, like the same results, they're praying in tongues, right? They're prophesying. Like that same manifestation is happening right here that we got from the Holy Spirit. And they're praising God. So they're obvious, it's obviously not demonic because they're praising Jesus, right? And so he thought, okay, I thought that the Gentiles weren't supposed to have the gospel. But this was my experience. What do I need to do? I need to go and look in the Word of God. And I need to compare my experience to the Word of God to figure out what that was. was what And what that means, right? And so he goes back to the Word of God. He compares his experience to the Word of God. And he realizes... By looking at the prophets, right? He realizes, hey, this was actually from God. Like this was like I didn't realize this, but it's God's will for the Gentiles to have the gospel. So one thing that that helped me over the last year, honestly, in this area, especially with all the religious, like the religious, like natural minded, like um stuff that's gotten in, into the minds of Americans when it comes to the word of God. And like all the theology and like all that that like the intellectual stuff that that clogs your ability to see, right? Because you got to see it in here. You don't. It's not up here. It's a, it's in here. You got to get it in here, and you got to see it inside. With all that, it's helped me over the last year to realize that experiences do matter if if they're affirmed by the Word of God. Does that make sense? Because I, I started realizing whenever I whenever the deliverance whenever I learned about deliverance, I realized okay there are all these people that are dealing with demonic stuff, and I never would have seen it just like the way I was reading the Bible because I was naturalizing everything in the Bible. But all these people are dealing with demonic stuff. When you command in the name of Jesus, whatever that is, to come out or to leave, until they're free, until they feel free, then all those problems go away. The suicidal thoughts go away. All that type of stuff. So. I need to look in the Word and figure out what the Word's saying on this. And then as I looked in the Word, I realized it was demonic bondage. I just never would have seen it. So I changed the way that I would view things because instead of, of it being like, I have to discover in here first and understand it before I apply it, it became, the way I looked at it was like, okay, I can understand everything in the world. Every, every experience I have, I can understand it using God's Word. And I can discern what it is and where it comes from, right? Like I figured out like, okay, there's only three powers in the world. There's the power of God, there's the power of the devil, and then there's the power of human beings, right? Therefore, since that's the case, since all, all there's only three sources of power, right? And since man can't produce, you know, a miraculous power, then that means that all miraculous power has to have, has to come from one of two sources, right? It has to come from either a demonic source, or it has to come from God, right? Like, so that's why, like, whenever you go overseas and you, to Africa, you have, like, dem you have witchcraft where you can go and, like, they'll, like, you'll, people will get healed. People will, will actually, like, get demonic knowledge. Like, they will get demonic insight and in, about, like, like, that person will know facts about their life that they shouldn't know, right, supernaturally, because they're using a demonic spirit to, like, operate in a demonic way to basically like try to impress you right and to give you a supernatural experience so whenever you start seeing that it's like okay so anything that has supernatural power it has to come from one of those two sources which means that experience is showing me how the spiritual realm operates right and you go and look in the word and the word confirms that right and so i started realizing okay wait this the bible has results and it's and like I can figure out based on these things how to operate in the things of the word. Like for example, every healing movement and anybody that operates in healing, 
and like sees a lot of people get healed, like had a clear anointing from God to see people get healed, like Catherine Coleman, right? Um, Benny Hinn would fall under that category. I'm trying to like Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, all those people, right? That that had strong healing anointings. Um, A. A. Allen, right? All those people, they all had the same theology when it came to healing. Believe it or not, they all believe this. They all believe that it's God's will for every Christian to be healed. That Christ paid for your your healing on the cross. He took up your sicknesses and diseases on the cross, and that sickness and disease came from the devil. They're an oppression from the devil, and it all stems from him, but that since Jesus overcame him on the cross, you have healing in the blood of Christ, right? They all believe the same thing, right? And so they all had an expectation that that people would be healed. So that, that belief meant that they expected it, which means they had faith to see more people get healed than people that are always like, Oh, you know, maybe it's not God's will in this wishy-washy thing, right? So it's pretty clear those people that believe that thing get those results, right? Why? Because they believe that thing. So you can understand things in the world a little bit better whenever you realize that that experience, like whenever you look at experiences and then go back to the word and affirm and then go back and forth. Like if this minister is having success, like with prophecy, right? I should probably go ask him and not somebody who's never even heard of prophecy and doesn't believe it exists. I should probably ask that guy how he's seeing those results. Because maybe, right, maybe that guy has revelation and light in his heart on how prophecy works and how to like honor God and bring glory to God through a prophetic ministry, right, that, that I don't have, which is what the Word of God shows you. It, it talks about like people that God puts in your life to teach you what the word of God says, how it's supposed to work. Does that make sense? So it's not this whole like, oh, that's your interpretation, that's mine. No, there's a truth, and you ha- you're responsible to figure it out. And if you don't figure it out, you won't walk in that area, right? Now, not, not everybody's called to walk in every area, but you have an area, and you have a path that you're on. And if you don't figure out the things that, that God has for you in your path, then you're not going to succeed in that path. Like, I'm called into evangelism and past- like probably pastoring. I'm not sure about that yet, but I'm definitely sure about evangelism. So if I don't figure out how to preach the gospel with power that where it produces results and people get healed, right, and like signs and wonders happen that attest that testify to the gospel, right, then I'm not going to get people saved. Like if I, especially if I go overseas, because they're going to be like, you have zero credibility. Like Jesus said himself, he's like, he said, if I don't do the the works of my Father, then don't believe me, is what he said. He said, but if I do the works of my Father then believe me that you may know that I'm in the Father and that the Father's in me. And if you go read, uh, what is it? I think it's like Luke 11. I could be wrong on this one. Um, John the Baptist, he sends his disciple to Jesus, and he's like, Send, go to Jesus and ask him this. Say, are you the one that we're looking for, or should we, should we be expecting somebody else? So he was struggling a little bit because things weren't going the way that he expected. And Jesus heard him, and he didn't say anything negative about John. But what he said was this. He said, go back and report to John the things that you see and the things that you hear. He said that the dead are raised, the blind see, the lame walk, and the the gospel of the kingdom of God is preached to the poor. So he said, go back and report to John the proofs. Go back and report to John the miracles and the works that I do. Don't tell him, like, don't give him some theology. Go and tell him about the signs, wonders, and miracles that you see, right? So Jesus himself said, like, like himself stated the importance of miracles. He says it in like John, I want to say it's John 6 or 7. He says, he says this, he says uh, how the testimony of John, he has the testimony of John testifying to him that, that he's the Messiah. He said, but then he says this, he says, but I have a testimony that's even weightier of John. That the good works that my father's given me to do, that I do them. The good works of signs and wonders. That's what he was talking about. So, um, Jesus himself affirmed that. Like, the, that the experience of seeing signs and wonders, like, testifies to the fact that somebody knew the word of God, somebody carried the word of God, and that it was from God, right? It was birth in God. Okay. So number two, the word of God is seed and the word of God is spirit. 
So Matthew 13 talks about how uh, the seed's sown on the path, it's sown on the, on the good soil, it's sown on the thorns, right? And all that is like the heart. It's talking about like the seed sown into the heart of man, but then it has different results, right? But then it's, it talks about the seed is the word of God. So the seed, it says, it talks about how like the seed is the word of God. And then you have the other parable where it talks about how the seed is like of the kingdom of God. It's like the smallest of all seeds, but it produces the largest of all trees. So if you don't have seed going out into people's hearts, then they're not going to be able to grow into whatever God has for them to grow into. You see, all of the word of God is a seed. So when you're, when you're sowing it, how, is, how does sowing and reaping work? You keep sowing and you keep sowing and you keep sowing and you keep sowing until you see the harvest that you're looking for, right? You don't just sow it and then one time and then you're good. You continue to sow it. And the more you sow, the more it compounds and it just builds and builds and builds. And that's how it is with reading the word. Because you, you finally, you read it and then you see something. Like for me, I think the first thing I saw was like the love of God. And so it was like, I studied and studied the word of the love of God. And then it was like, oh, the church and like these things. And like your, your amount of revelation, like expands, if that makes sense. It like the, the circle of your knowledge gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm talking like your, your heart knowledge of the, of the kingdom of God. And because of that, your spirit and your spiritual life grows, your capacity spiritually grows. And then the second thing you got to know about this is that the word of God is spirit. So I'm going to read this in John 6. This is important. So Jesus talks about his, the words that he speaks. Where is it? Struggling to find it here, folks. This is why I recommend getting it this is another reason why I recommend getting the word of God in you because then you could just overflow out of it and you don't have to look it up all the time. Um, okay, here we go. John 6, 63, it says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life, and they are life. But it says it's a lowercase s, spirit. So he's like, the spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So whatever it's whatever it is, it's got to come from God. Like you got to get like, it's got to be spiritual from the Holy Spirit, like producing whatever you produce. That in the out rather than out to in life. And then it says this. It says the words that he says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So the words that Jesus spoke, they weren't flesh or they won't, they weren't physical. He was always talking about spiritual things. Like he says, do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear the spiritual substance of this word, the spiritual power that, that I'm giving you through these words? So the word of God itself is, a, is spirit. It is spirit, and it's designed to hit the spirit of, of men and women to produce something inside of them, right? That's why, that's why you get what you preach, all right? So... And, and that's why it's important to understand that this is different than an intellectual message. It, 1 Corinthians 2 talks about how the spiritual man understands and discerns all things. He's to be judged by no one and, and can judge all things. He can evaluate everything because he's spiritual and because he discerns things like from the spiritual realm first, right? It says the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God, for he cannot understand them because they're, they're born and discerned of God. Because they're spiritual. So the words that, that, that we speak when we're preaching are not to be these intellectual, like, you know, like intellectual, like messages about like man's wisdom, right? Because he says, I didn't come to you in, in, in man's wisdom, but in the power of the Holy Spirit so that your faith wouldn't be rest on man's wisdom, but on the power of God. So if, if we just produce these like intellectual messages, you know, like, oh, you know, like psychology says this and like, you know, science says that like, like, like this, this and this about anxiety. And so and the Bible says this, it's like that comes from here that can only hit somebody here. But when you preach from here, 
and you speak the word of God out of the spirit. So you let the words of, of Christ that are spirit get into your spirit, and then you speak them to, intending to hit somebody in the heart, intending to speak to the heart of that individual. Then that has the power, the spiritual capacity to actually change their heart. This is why preaching is so important. Like preaching, the proclamation of the truth by faith and with power and boldness, right? Because then it, it gets it where it's from the heart and from the like the inner like desire, like out of that person's mouth to where it can like actually hit somebody experientially so that they can receive it in their heart. But so if you aren't sowing any seeds into your heart, then you're not gonna have any spiritual harvest of like new faith or anything like that. You understand faith doesn't come from your mind or from your experience. Faith comes from the word of God. So as you sow the seed of the word of God in your heart, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you sow that seed, you open your heart up to the word, right? So that you can hear the message. Then the word of God gets into your heart and it produces faith and that faith grows. So if you're struggling to believe financially something, then you, you, Take the seed of the word of God and you plant it into your heart over and over and over and over and over again until you start to believe wholeheartedly and expect that God is going to bless you financially because you're obeying him financially, right? That seed of the word of God is what builds up your spirit, the capacity of your spirit to be able to like do more things for God. Now, number three, and it's pretty, it's, it's honestly similar, is the word of God is bread. So Jesus says, man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So if you eat three meals a day, seven days a week, but you only eat one snack every Sunday at church of, of the word of God that's just preached, 30 minute snack, how on earth are you going to spiritually survive your life if you don't have the word of God? You see, the word of God is literally bread and food for your spiritual man, like it's bread for you in here. And you want, we wonder, honestly, we wonder why this generation's plagued by anxiety, like in the church. I understand if you're outside the church, like I don't have a solution for you, you know, like, but if you, if you're a Christian, right, we have the promises of the word of God. So why is that still happening? Maybe it's because we weakened our preaching. Weak preaching gets weak, weak Christians, but strong preaching gets strong Christians that can actually perpetuate a revival, that can actually see miracles and, and God do big things, right? But it, so if you preach weak things and you don't get the word of God into the hearts of people and you don't prioritize the word of God, then you don't have any faith that you've built up in your heart. You don't have any expectation from based on the word of God. And so you can't overcome anxiety and depression and all that type of stuff. It's impossible. It's literally impossible. You understand? And I want I want to close with this. So worship is great. I'm talking to, I want to speak to my generation a little bit because my generation, I hear a lot about like worship, like, oh, we got to create an atmosphere for God and a place for you to encounter God. And that's great. Like worship's essential. And that, that's where, that's what it is. You get an encounter with the presence of God. It's amazing, right? It produces like this, like like the presence of God, you realize that like the love of God and all that type of stuff, like the, any, any seed of the word of God that was in your heart prior can come to life whenever you're in the presence of God and you realize that, right? Like you realize the truth. But the word of God is the bread and the seed for spiritual growth. Like it produces faith. That's the, that's the only place that the Bible says faith comes from. It doesn't say faith comes from singing songs or praising God. It says that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you look at, at Ephesians, we'll pull it up, Ephesians 4, it talks about how Christ gave gifts unto men. And, and what were those gifts? Those gifts were people that he gave to the church. And why did he give them to the church? It says for their edification, for them to be able to not fall into to false doctrine, here it is, Ephesians 4. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, 
So equipping the saints to be able to do what God tells them to do. So you can't do what God tells you to do unless you, you have these people equipping you, right, with the Word of God. It says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, no longer as children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So it talks about the the five, the five, like, I'm forgetting the word right now, but the, the five people of the body of Christ that, like, are there to build you up in the word. Listen to what they are. Apostles, Paul and Peter were apostles. They wrote most of the Bible. Prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Evangelists preach the gospel. Pastors shepherd the flock with the word of God. And teachers teach the word of God. So in all that of, of the list of the gifts from Christ to, to us for that ministry of building us up with the word of God and, all, and, and equipping us to be able to do what God has for us, Worship leaders not in that list. I say that not to slam worship leaders because I love worship and like I love the presence of God and like the joy of the Lord and all that type of stuff. But I say that because it's important because if you only have worship, like picture this, if you took somebody, you got rid of preaching, you got rid of the word of God in the Bible and all that, like you got rid of those two things and you put somebody where with their level of knowledge of the Bible in, in a worship atmosphere for a year, no access to those other things. They're going to be whatever amount of like the presence of God and like closeness with him, like that's in like whatever capacity they have, according to that word, like it, it will be reached, but it won't grow. Like the word of God brings the word or the worship brings the word of God to life. It gets you in touch with the father. But if you don't know God's word, if you don't have the word of God from, from him, on how things work, how to equip people, how to do his work, right? Like this says, then you won't be able to do everything that God has for you. You see how it's a limit? There's a limit. There's only so much that, like, like your limitation literally is just the, the amount of truth inside of your heart. That's why you fast and pray, too. Fasting brings revelation. So worship's great, right? It's a, it's a great way to encounter God to establish your relationship with God. But that's just the tie that that you and, and God being one so that you can go out together being empowered by God to accomplish what he has for you. And if you don't know the word of God, if you don't know how things work, if you don't know how to preach, if you don't know what's true, right, truth, then you're gonna, you could be deceived. Especially right now, it talks about the great falling away in the Bible, right? It talks about how there will be doctrines of demons in the last times. Like that will sweep through the church and pull many away. Where it talks about in 2 Timothy 3, it says, it talks about how terrible the last days will be. And it says they'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny its power. And so if you don't know what the Bible says, then you're not going to know what, what the strategy of the devil is. You're not going to know what's right and wrong. So worship's great and it's essential, but the word of God, if you don't have the word of God, then you have zero shot because it's not going to get easier. It's going to get trickier. And the attacks of the devil aren't going to get smaller. They're going to get greater. And, and so you have to know what God says. And it's not this passive thing like, oh, you know, God will show me like in the right time. Like, no, you got to get in the word and you got to figure it out. And he will show you as much as you seek. We'll wrap it up with this verse. He who seeks finds. He who knocks the doors open to him who, uh, I forget in the last part of it, but, uh, I don't know why I'm forgetting the last part of that verse. But he who knocks the doors open, he who seeks finds, and to him who uh, asks, it is given to him. There it is. So you've got to ask, seek, and knock. If you don't ask, seek, and knock, and, and search for God, he says, seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So if you don't seek for God in his scripture, then you're not going to find. It's not this passive thing like, oh, you know, God will just like, show me from heaven whenever I need to know. No, if you don't know, then you won't know what you need to know. It's, he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's what, that's what I've experienced. I mean, honestly, I, there've been times in my life where I've suffered in areas because I didn't know what the word of God said in that area. 
And that's why I'm so passionate about the subject, because I don't want you to suffer for not knowing what the Word of God says in that area. What, again, whatever you don't know from, about, from the Word of God is an area where the devil can attack you. It's an area where you don't have like the promise of God in that area. And it's an area where you're limited in accomplishing what God has for you to accomplish. So that's all I have for you today. Um, I just wanted to lay that out there. Like as we haven't talked about it yet, and I wanted to make that clear. Like just the three, three little things about the word and what the importance of the word is in your life. So I hope that this helped you. Um, comment in the comment section if this helped you. And we're going to keep you updated on content. We're going to keep getting uh, events out and all that type of stuff. Um, but I love doing this. I love getting to uh, encourage you and like preach the word of God to you. And so I hope that this helped you today. I encourage you, get into the scriptures. Fast, pray. Ask God to show you. Ephesians 1, he's praying that they have the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they can know the greatness of the power that's within them. They can know the greatness of the power according to, to the power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, right? So revelation of the scriptures, as you seek God and you ask him to reveal to you the scriptures, he will open your eyes to the power that you have in Christ to, and it will open the door to a supernatural life of signs and wonders where you can walk in the power of God in every single area of your life, even parenting your kids. I mean, whatever it is, there's nothing too small that the power of God can't, can't help you with. So that's, that's the inheritance that God has for you. That's, that's, your, that's the will of God for you as, as a Christian. I love you all. I'll, I'll see you soon. I'll catch you later.